So welcome to the weekly service from the Elim Church in the Home Valley. We're delighted that you've joined us this, this evening on this very warm occasion. And uh, we've all got bottles of water here. So we're going to go home blessed and refreshed. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for your goodness towards us this evening. We thank you that you are a loving God, you're a good God who is on our side, who desires the best for us, who wishes to abundantly bless us and to know the reality of a life in all its fullness. Father, we pray for revelation tonight, revelation to our hearts that will make a difference eternally, revelation to our hearts that will inspire our faith and draw us closer to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We remember those who are not with us this evening for one reason or another, those that are still recovering from COVID, those who are poorly. Father, we pray your blessing and your anointing upon them in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And I, Father, pray that even as they uh, watch this broadcast from home, that they would know healing flowing into their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, our gal. So tonight, um, I'm going to read uh, 1 Peter 3.15. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We live in a very opinionated society when you look on the internet, um, one person can say something which to me seems quite reasonable and level-headed and not off the wall at all, and someone else will come in and attack them verbally, often with ridicule and venom. You may have had that happen to you. People are all too ready to spout their own opinion and view. Now, whilst we need wisdom in such a society not to get into pointless arguments and mudslinging, Scripture does tell us to be ready, be ready, prepared to seize the opportunity, always, perpetually, every time, to give an answer, an argument, a reasoned statement, a defence of the hope that is in you, our faith, our expectation, our salvation, not with rudeness and arrogance, but with meekness and fear. Meekness, um, a gentle attitude, and fear, respect, reverence. Will you get shouted down or ridiculed? Probably by some. But we have the truth that sets men free. We have the words of eternal life. We have the wisdom that will make the simple wise, and we have the light that will penetrate the darkness. Amen? In a society where we're getting to that point where evil is called good, darkness is called light, and bitter is called sweet. You'll find that in Isaiah 5.20. We need to be ready to speak the truth. It is not my responsibility how people react to that truth, but it is my responsibility to speak it. Otherwise, how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? Romans 10, 14. So let's not be afraid to lift his name on high at every opportunity. Amen? Amen. 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 I will set my face. Let's worship him. <clears throat>
Hallelujah. Lord, we love to worship you. We just love to lift your name on high. Lord, not only when we are here within the four walls of this building, this church, but since we are the church, Lord, when we go out, when we go out and meet other people, when we see other people, when we go out and there's opportunities presented to us to lift your name high, not to, not to be brash or arrogant about our witness, but to live naturally in your flow, to let your spirit flow out of us, your love, your life, your truth, because men need to hear that. Oh, Lord, it's so good to praise you. May we just carry that, that sweet scent of Jesus. Lord, we, we sense you here because you're in each one of us and that, that life flows from us. Hallelujah but to carry that with us as we go about our week, carrying you and being the fragrance of Christ to many people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that you are alive. You are not dead, but you live and you reign. And by your Holy Spirit, you live within our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Uh, okay, so we have, a, we have a few testimonies. I'm going to share one of those testimonies unless she wants to share it herself. Are you still not wanting to share this testimony, Lynn? You're not. You're going to have to tell me if I go wrong then, won't you? All right? No, you're not going to tell me if I go wrong. <laughs> Lynn has a wonderful testimony. I've tried to twist her arm and uh, get her to share it, but she won't. But she has given me permission to share it on her behalf. If I don't get, quite, get the details quite accurately, she'll correct them afterwards. But for the past 40 years, uh, Lynn has been suffering with migraines. And uh, they've been on and off, on and off. And they're, if anybody of you have ever suffered a migraine, they're not particularly pleasant events that happen in her life. Over the years, she's prayed and sought the Lord for healing for a migraine and not got anywhere, not really found that she's received an answer, not had, had that manifestation of healing in her life to such an extent that you know what it's like when you pray for healing for such a long time, you almost give up and you say, I've tried so hard. Well, here it is, you tried so hard. Well, there's the first error because it's not about how hard we try, it's about what Jesus has already done. But you understand what we meant, what, 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 what I mean, in that you expend so much energy in trying to, to receive your healing and it, it doesn't seem to manifest that you get frustrated and you, you, the enemy sort of almost forces you to give up and say, there's no hope. Why bother anymore? Everybody else's prayer gets answered, but mine doesn't. Um, I'm just going to have to learn to live with it. And the other Thursday evening at the home group, uh, I, I guess that uh, Lynn was just uh, voicing where she was at. And uh, we had some encouragement to give her. And, and Gail encouraged her and, and, uh, afterwards and said, look, would you like me to send you uh, my morning devotion with the scriptures that remind us how good God is every morning. Because whenever we are struggling with the healing, the answer is always to look to God, to look up. And uh, so uh, Lynn started to uh, receive these scriptures on her phone every morning. And by the way, if you want the daily devotional sent to you, 07946113817, text girls, she'll send them to you. Um, uh, that will come up on the screen. Um, I've lost my thought, track of thought. So you were getting these texts, but the texts that were coming through encouraged you to deep further into the scripture. So she started reading another devotional and she started reading her Bible uh, more than she ever had done. And these are her words that over the last 40 years, God has got smaller because, you know, uh, but now God is getting bigger. And previously, when she had a migraine, she'd look, she'd, she'd feel the flashing lights coming on at eight o'clock in the morning and, and she'd say, oh, dearie me. This is going to last how many hours? Half an hour. This is going to last half an hour. Another half an hour, I shall be all right, but dearie me. And Gail encouraged her that, you know, look, when, when you feel a migraine coming on, instead of saying this is going to last half an hour, why don't you just thank Jesus for his goodness towards you and his love towards you and his healing towards you too? So anyway, the long story goes short is that... Uh, Lynn had started to absorb all these Bible verses that she was reading and the devotionals that she was getting hold of. She was getting a revelation of who she was in Christ and that the enemy had no authority to mess with her life. Am I getting it right? Amen. Uh, and, and so whenever she felt a migraine coming on, she'd say, I'm not having this. You've got no authority to mess with my life, devil. Mr. Devil, get lost. I'm a child of Jesus's. Well, anyway, thank you, Jesus. The other morning, she felt a migraine coming on. And she thought, oh, no, I've not got to think about how long it's going to last. I'm just going to look up. 
But she just started remembering the scriptures. She started thanking Jesus. She started giving him the glory. And only Lynn can tell it this way. I'm sorry, I'm not really communicating it. But she said that she got so absorbed in praising the Lord and thanking him for who he was and remembering the truth of God's word that she forgot that she had a migraine and that it had gone. Now, Lynn, you tell the story a lot better than I do, but um, thank you, Jesus. And I want to encourage you uh, here, I want to encourage you at home because sometimes the pain shouts louder than anything else. You know, when, when you've got a migraine or when you've got a chronic condition, it, it shouts. And it's difficult to keep your eyes upon the Lord. But I want to encourage you that as you get your eyes on the Lord, as you get a revelation from him, God's goodness overflows. And you recognise that the enemy has no right to mess with your life. You're a child of the King. Jesus died for you on the cross that you might be healed and to just to enjoy that fullness of life. Amen. Have I got that right? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Chris, come and uh, share your testimony. I'm going to stand here so the microphone can, my microphone can pick you up. Yeah, um, before I start, one thing I want to remind you all. Do you know, God isn't the answer to some of our problems. Right. He's the answer to all of Amen. our problems. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> and you know, most of you know that Caroline and I run a charity. We work out in Romania. And part of the way the charity is funded is when we go out to do the work, we take people out on holiday trips and we charge them the cost of the trip, but then the gift aid on what they've paid helps keep the charity running. So in September, Caroline's going out for a fortnight, I'm going out for a week, and we take in eight other people out with us to see the work, see what we do, and to fund the, the charity. Um, we fly with Air. We fly from Doncaster. Last weekend, I got a text from Wizz Air telling me all our flights were cancelled. Everything's booked, the hotels are booked, the trips are booked, everything's booked, but all our flights are cancelled. So what they did, they said, we could either have our money back or we could have 120% of our money in credit. So I thought, right, we need to go, everything's booked, i best look around for other flights. So I went on the Wizz Air site and I found out that on the exact same dates from Doncaster, I could rebook the flights. So we rebooked the flights for everybody, fly at the same time, get there at the same time, come home at the same time, arrive back at the same time. The only difference is it's, Donca it's, it's Birmingham instead of Doncaster. So I booked all the flights again, paid it all with our Wizz Air credit, when everything was paid, there's a credit of 1,200 euros left in our account for the charity when it's going out to do more yeah, aid. Yeah. So what I thought was an absolute disaster turned into an absolute super blessing. Because the Doncaster flights... The, the Doncaster flights were 200 quid, weren't they? The, the Doncaster flights, yeah, they, 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 they vary, but it's September, so it's expensive. Yeah. One of the flights out from Birmingham for five of us is seven pound ninety nine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. So, so they benefited from the difference. But Praise the God. Got 1, Amen. Got in credit for flights in future. Amen. So, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> I just wanted to say how how great God's been for me recently because um, I've had a few health issues that have been quite difficult. And I had an MRI scan recently, which I was really, really worried about, um, potentially for what could have happened from that. Um, but God is great. He's absolutely yeah. amazing. He really answered my prayers, and um, that was clear. So, Amen. Just him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And we just agree in Jesus' name that uh, whatever needs to be done will be done and you'll be completely free in Jesus name we agree amen okay good so 
This is the scripture that we were talking about last week. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And Paul is saying, finally, the most important thing that I have to say to you is that the enemy is coming against you. Make sure that you do not allow him to steal that which God has given you. A bit like having an iPhone. Say if you're somebody gave your father gave you an iphone gave a child an, an iphone and says this is how you make a phone call this is how you send a text this is how you do video this is how you go on uh, email this is how you do internet this is how you do the games and whatever every, everything else that the iphone does and once the father has explained to the child exactly how it works and all the gizmos and the, all the wonderful things it can do he says to it it costs a lot of money but don't worry i've paid for it but don't lose it. <laughs> Finally, don't lose it. And it's as if Paul is saying to us, look, God has given us so many blessings. He's saved us by grace. He's given us, given us the Holy Spirit. So many blessings. He's removed the barrier that was between us and God. I've explained it to you. I've shown you all about it. The good thing is that you don't have to do anything. It's all being paid for. Isn't it wonderful what God has done? Finally, make sure you don't lose it. Make sure you don't allow the enemy to steal from you. The, uh, uh, be ready for the wiles of the enemies. There's a footnote uh, the, in the... Uh, word wiles in the new king james that explains this word strategies of the devil tricks deceit calculated fraudster he is one who deliberately sets out to trick you to steal that which is rightfully yours and we need to be ready king james commentary says this men dream of a devil that is a hideous horned and hoof monster who haunts the haunts the vice dens of the world but god says he fashions himself into an angel of light and fashions his ministers as ministers of righteousness he is the champion of liberalism ritualism ritualism rationalism and every other ism that seeks to displace Christ. His aim is to substitute something else and something different for the grace of gr grace and truth of Christ. Never underestimate the enemy. And what caught me out of what caught my eye and that my attention out of uh, that commentary, that little footnote in the New King James Commentary uh, Bible, it says his aim is to substitute something else and something different. For the grace of God and the truth of Christ. Grace, God's undeserved favour. If God can convince, if the, sorry, if the enemy can, can convince you that you have to do something for him to love you, then he's got you on a good one. If he can convince you that you've got to fast for so many days, read your Bible upside down and backwards and upside down if he can convince you that you've got to go on some pilgrimage if he he can convince you that you've got to abstain from some certain food if he can convince you that you've got to give so much money away before he will answer your prayer it all becomes about what you can do rather than about what Jesus has already done and when you are thinking about what you have to do when you approach God in prayer you don't come with confidence because if it's all about you, there is always that question mark about whether what you have done has been good enough. And of course, anything that we can do is never good enough, but Jesus is good enough. Our confidence is not in ourselves and all the hoops and the hurdles uh, that the enemy would try to get us to jump through and over, but our confidence is in Jesus Christ who has already paid the price so that when we approach God, we don't have to come to him uh, wondering whether he will answer us, answer us or not. It's a bit like um, me saying to um, David, uh, David, next time, um, uh, let's just pretend you haven't got any money, all right? Let's just pretend that you're hard up and you're finding it difficult to make ends meet. And I say to you, David, um, David, next time you go into the cafe, your coffee's paid for. 
and you say, well, thank you very much, okay? So you approach the, approach the counter and you, and you say to, to Ian, I says, my coffee's paid for. And you ask for it in confidence, knowing that it's already paid. If, on the other hand, you go into the cafe and you've got no money, you approach the counter wondering whether you can get a free coffee or not, or a free cup of tea. Yeah. Wondering whether, you know, say, say that it's me that's on, wondering whether that I am in a good mood. I'm wondering whether, well, David, you know, not today. And sometimes when we think it's all about us, when we, can't, when we don't approach God with the confidence that what we're asking for is already paid for, we approach gingerly and shyly and without confidence and without full faith. We come with doubt in our minds and wonder and fear. But Jesus has done it all. So we've got to be determined to... Remember that we have been saved by grace through faith, that not ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. See, this is what Paul has been writing to the Ephesian church. Don't lose this, don't lose, don't lose this important truth. It's by grace that you've been saved. And sometimes we, the enemy will, will say that God is the spy in the sky that is out to zap us. And I want you just to examine your own thinking sometimes. Sometimes we just need to stop and think, do I have any of this kind of thinking in my mind, which is uh, really a mentality, which is not grace and God's favour towards my mind, towards my life. And I wonder whether sometimes um, people say, uh, when, when they um, uh, say they, they go to... Uh, get a takeaway coffee from somewhere and the lid falls off and they spill it all over themselves. And they say, well, that's because, that's because I, I had an argument with my spouse before I walk, walked out the door. That's payback. I think the, the common parlance is karma. You know, you do something wrong and you, there's a payback for it. Well, that's Buddhist thinking, by the way. Not Christian thinking. God is not in the, in the game of paying back because Jesus has already paid the price. So we just need to guard ourselves from the idea that we're not saved by grace and that Jesus is not the answer to every problem in our lives. So last week we looked at some of the ways that the devil tries to trick us by undermining the truth of what the word of God says. And God bless them, you know, I'm sorry to hearken on about this sometimes, I won't, I won't go on about it too much tonight. But God bless them, I, I was, read an article in the jolly BBC News website that even the Church of England now are saying, we need to think about what a woman is. As if they didn't know. You know, and, and I quite like what somebody quipped that if you don't know what a woman is, marry one and you'll soon find out. <laughs> but we live in a situation, don't we, where, um, where, where it, if we say that a woman is, is, is somebody that has babies, you know, we're in trouble. Look at the jolly trouble that J.K. Rowling is in because she said something very similar. As Gail pointed out, Earlier on, we live in a world, don't we, where uh, the bitter is sweet and the sweet is bitter and that which is good is bad and that which is bad is good. We need to make sure that we uphold the truth of God's word. But then, you know, when we're talking about upholding the truth, you know, I, I can go on all night about political correctness and what's right and wrong in society at the moment, but I want to personalise it a little bit because the enemy comes not only against culture and against society, but it comes against us in our personal walk with God. In what ways does the enemy come and lie to you and challenge God's grace and truth of who Christ is? Here's one. that often, You'd be surprised how often as a pastor I hear this. I have committed the unforgivable sin. 
Has the enemy convinced you that you've, forgiven, you've committed the unforgivable sin? Well, if I look at myself and look at the other people in the church, I'm done, I'm done, you don't know what I've done. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. It's because you weren't good enough that none of us are not good enough that God sent Jesus. So the unforgivable sin is rejecting who Jesus is and what he has paid for to you on the cross. So there's one that's a common one. Here are some other common ones that I hear as a pastor. God always answers everybody else's prayers but mine. Ouch. How many of you have said that? Because how many of you get to that place where, where you've been praying and you've been praying and you've been praying and you're, you're, you're standing in faith and nothing seems to happen. You don't get the answer to your prayer and you look around at everybody else in the church getting their prayers answered. And the enemy will convince you that God doesn't want to answer your prayers. But God answers even your prayers. Hallelujah. Praise God. God never speaks to me. Ouch, ouch. <laughs> well, the very fact that you're here, the very fact that you've given your life to the Lord, would indicate to me that God has spoken to you at some point in your life. So never tell me that God has never spoken to you. And even as you sit here tonight and as you listen to God's word, and God is speaking to you. You might not hear an audible voice, but God speaks to your spirit. God speaks to your heart. God, God feeds you. God could never use me. Ouch, ouch, ouch. I'm no good at anything. Ouch, 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 ouch. I don't have any gifts. And that's usually followed by, I wish I was like so and so. Or here's another one. I guess I will just have to put up with it. God is a God who answers prayers. Don't allow the enemy to convince you that God doesn't answer your prayer. Some things will never change. Hallelujah. God is in the changing business. Science has disproved this. See, the enemy whispers in our ears, you know, about all, all these things. Science has disproved this. This is why I can't believe. But uh, as I keep on saying to you, if you've been listening to me any length of time, science changes. God's word doesn't. There was, a, there was an article in The Guardian the other week. You, you can Google it and you can find it. But it was something to, to this effect that scientists were saying that they needed to rethink Darwin's theory of evolution because there were some gaps. Some scientists had sat down and examined it and they thought to themselves, hey, up, this doesn't bear scrutiny. We've got to rethink this. So they're trying to rethink it now. Easier just to believe what God says. Hallelujah. So we can't, we can't trust science. Science is shifting all the time. God's word does not change. I'm not blessed. <laughs> Nobody loves me. Well, if I were a betting man, I would bet everybody in this place has at least said one of those things at least once. You might be saying them now. Don't allow the enemy to pull the rug from under your feet. Don't allow the enemy to steal that which is rightfully yours. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness in the heavenly places. So Paul is saying, here, here, when we are facing challenges in our lives, 
We're going to recognise who is behind it. It's not flesh and blood. It's the principalities and the powers that are behind it. So often we might say in our life, you know, if, 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 if we could just get rid of this person in, in my life, then everything would be okay. So sometimes we can have a boss that's really nasty and we might say, well, my life would be much happier in this, in, 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 at work if I didn't have this boss for a bully. I hate so-and-so, name in the, in the boss's name. But actually... Our battle is not against flesh and blood, it's against the enemy. So it's not the person that we need to hate, we need to hate the person behind what that person is doing. Then you may know someone who just rubs you up the wrong way and tries to discourage you. Well, if we could just get rid of them, then we'll no longer be discouraged. No, that's not how it works, because the person is not the problem, the enemy is the problem. We need, to be, we need just to refuse to be discouraged, we need to resist the devil, stand up against the devil, stand on the truth of what God says, rather than the lie of the evil one. People can be really nasty sometimes. Uh, have you ever, if you have not discovered that, you might have discovered it soon. People can be really nasty. You know, and sometimes you might be having an off day and the enemy might be going for the, for the jugular. And I often find that when you're having a bad day and, and he, he, he's, he, he's got a, his foot in the door, once he's got his foot in the door, he'll, he'll, he'll go for as much as he can. So in, in the cafe, for example, you know, there are people who will... Who will so, so here, here I am in the cafe and you're already feeling discouraged and somebody comes in and says, don't like the colour of the paint on your walls. People complain about anything. This is too hot, it's too cold, it's too weak, it's too strong. Don't like it in this cup. I'd rather have it in a mug. I want ice. Don't want, you can put too much ice in it. Have you got a straw? Don't like that straw. Yeah, you'd be surprised that people get nasty because you say to them, well, Excuse me, can you not put your rubbish in our bin? Because we have to pay 50, p- 50 pound, not 50p, 50 pound for that, this bin to be emptied. Do you mind not putting it in us? And you just get a mouthful of abuse. And you think to yourself, dear. And you think to yourself, if only I could get rid of these miserable, horrible people. It's not the miserable, horrible people that are the problem. It's the enemy behind them that is the problem. And so it's not a case of, I hate so-and-so, I hate this person and that person, but recognising who is that person, the enemy, behind who is driving that person to attack you, make you doubt. Recognise, as we were saying the other week, who the real enemy is. But then also I want just to note that the... um, uh, the, uh, Oh, yeah. yeah. So the real enemy is the spiritual armies of wickedness, Satan and his demons. And I've got a scripture here that some people might think, Oh, the enemy's out to get me. Well, remember again from Ephesians 1, 20, 20 to 1, that the power is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but in the one to come. Far above. He didn't just say that, that Jesus is above the enemy. He said far above. And so when we sort of think about Jesus' power and the enemy's power, they're not even on the same scale because the enemy has no power. So it's not a a question of a power encounter or the fact that there's, there's a power struggle. The struggle that we face is a truth struggle because the enemy is trying to convince us that we're not saved by grace and that Jesus is not who he says he is. It's a struggle to maintain truth. But then just one more thing before I move on. Principalities and powers suggest a hierarchy. 
So we've got archangels and angels. We know that, don't we? So uh, God responds to a prayer and, and says to the, Michael the archangel, I want you to sort this out. And Michael the archangel dispatches one of his angels and gets that prayer answered and this prayer answered. And there is order in the heavenly realm. Now, can you imagine that a third of the, uh, of the angels fell? Lucifer took a third of the heavenly angels with him. And he is the leader, the archangel, if you like, of the, of the demons. But in contrast to the fact that the heavenly angels are all in order, because the devil is a liar, because the devil is a deceiver, because the devil is a trickster, the enemy's camp is all confused and in chaos. So remember, the enemy has no power. The demons are in chaos. God's angels are in order, answering their, our prayers. Okay, in the 10 minutes that I've got left, let's just look at the armour of God and the belt of truth. Here it is from Ephesians 6, 13 to 14. Therefore put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, this is one of those verses in the NIV that perhaps you could easily lose the truth or the depth of what it's saying. The New American Standard Bible says, having your loins girt about with truth. Now, when you say having your loins girt about with truth, you could perhaps understand why the NIV has said with, your, with the belt of truth. But we need to understand that gird your loins is an idiom for being ready. So 1 Peter 1.13 says, gird up the loins of your mind. The NIV says, prepare your minds for action to the bridesmaids, bridesmaids waiting for the bridegroom's return. Let your loins be girded about you and keep your lamps burning. The NIV says, be ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Gird your loins was an idiom for being ready because in Bible times, um, the, the, the tunics that they they wore was just a, a square of cloth, if you like, with a slit in the top that they poked the red through. And the, 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 the cloak would, would go down to the feet. And if you were wanting to do run a race or go into battle, what you'd need to do, you'd need to pull up the length of what you were wearing and tuck it in to your girdle, to your belt, so that you had free access. It's a bit like somebody that is running a race. You see these athletes now, don't you, with the, these very skin-tight, um, um, I'm going to say overalls, uniforms. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, kit. Thank you. With very, very, very uh, tight kit. So that they can run freely without hindrance. Be ready for battle. It would stop them tripping over. It would enable them to stand securely. Be ready for battle at the outset. It's the truth that's going to hold you together. The belt was six inches wide and it's thought that a lot of the other uh, pieces of armour that we'll get to in the coming weeks were fastened to this belt. So we could say that truth holds everything together. Now there are two ways that the word truth can be understood. Number one, truth as content so God's word is truth. John 17, 17 says Jesus is truth. Um, uh, uh, so God's word is truth. John 17, 17. Jesus is truth. Uh, John 14, 16. I am the way, the truth and the life. So it's important that as we go into battle, we know that we are held together by the truth of God's word and who he is. Ephesians 4.14 says that one of the uh, ways that the enemy will cunningly and craftily try to deceive us is through every wind of doctrine. So we need to know the truth. I'm not going to park too much on this uh, this evening, but how do you know uh, when something is a lie that is very deceitful? Will you compare it to the truth? Did I ever tell you that I work for Sainsbury's? Um, and every now and again, we'd have these 
fake £10 notes come through or forged £20 notes and they'd come through the tills and um, when, you, when you saw one, you thought to yourself, dearie me, well, that's, that, that looks good. I wouldn't know the difference. You know, it's, it's amazing that if I was to ask you to describe what a £10 note looked like and what were the security features of it, you probably wouldn't know unless you got one out of your pocket and compared it to the, to the fake. The way that you discovered, or the way that you could train people whether it was a fake, was to compare it to a true £20 note or a true £10 note. One of the ways that you'd do is you just feel it. It didn't feel the same. The print looked a bit the wrong colour and things like that. If you're not ready with the truth, you will be gullible and accept the lie. So... There are two ways, as I say, that we could understand the belt of truth. Truth is content. Truth is going to hold us together. But a lot of commentators say, and this is why we're not going to park any more on it here right now, is that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. The truth of the word of God. So is it that Paul is saying that the, 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 the belt of truth is the word of God? It, in this instance, in which case he would be repeating himself when he talks about the sword of the spirit being the word of God, or are you talking about the truth being something different? Well, some commentators think that he's talking about something different, and I'll conclude with this tonight. They say that the truth that Paul is talking about here is the truth as an attitude of truthfulness. This is sincerity, non-hypocrisy, honesty, commitment, integrity. You are who you say you are. You believe what you say you believe. There is no doubt as to whose side you want. I'm a soldier in God's army and I'm ready for action and nothing's going to stop me. What you see is what you get. I am not going to melt when it gets hot. I'm not a fake. I'm true. The word sincere is from a Latin word which means without wax. And it was a word that used to describe um, uh, jugs in the Roman world, in the Latin world, because when a, a jug was fired and maybe there was a fault in the firing and it turned out that there was a, uh, it, it wasn't watertight, what they would do just to, to, to cover up the hole in the, in, the, in the waterproofing of the jug is that they would put some wax over it. You know, there you are. There's a nice vase for you. There's a nice jug for you. It looks lovely. What they just done, they polished it up with a bit of wax. It looked fine. Until it got hot and the, max, and the wax melted. And then the insincerity of the person who had sold it to you was exposed. Sincere vase without wax. We should be people who are not covering up, pretending to be someone who we are not. When it gets hot, we're not going to go, we're not going to melt and fall apart. I'm not talking about hot temperature here. I mean, when God, when the enemy comes hot against us, when the going gets rough, we're going to stand. A man of integrity has a clear conscience and can face the enemy without fear. He's no skeletons in the cupboard. They've all been forgiven. With the belt of truth firmly fastened, he will not be found with his pants down. (laughs) Isaiah 57 says this, Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I I will know, I will not be put to shame. What Paul, I believe, is encouraging us to be is soldiers who are facing the battle with truthfulness and sincerity, full of integrity, not half-hearted, because you can't enter a battle half-hearted. You can't enter a battle pretending to be somebody that you're not. You can't enter a battle not trusting in Jesus. Because you will be exposed. But this scripture tells me that because the Lord helps me, I will not be exposed. I will not be disgraced. 
because he is my righteousness, which we'll get onto next week. I will not be put to shame. To have the belt of truth firmly fastened, you're saying, I'm ready and prepared to advance for God. To have the belt on means to say, I am committed. I'm not lukewarm or half hard hearted. Uh, lukewarm or half hearted. I'm not pretending to be someone I'm not. I'm not trusting in my own strength. I'm strengthened by God. I'm trusting in His truth. I will not be ashamed. I will not disgraced, be disgraced. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm a soldier in the Lord's army and I'm ready for action. Amen. Amen. I'll leave it there. Gal, come and uh, lead us in our last song.
Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. We are going to be people who stand on the truth of your word. We are ready for action. We are sincere. We're not half-hearted. We're not going to the, into the battle trusting in our own strength, but we're going into battle trusting in you. Thank you, Jesus. And maybe as I've spoken this evening and you identify with some of those lies that perhaps you've fallen for from the enemy, if you want encouragement and support and you want those uh, questions answered that perhaps the enemy is trying to speak into your heart, give us a call on 01484 323 and we'll gladly talk to you and encourage you. You can send us a text 0747 277 3243. You can send us an email at info at hvelim.org. Dot UK. Amen. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, we look forward to seeing you this week. Keep cool. Keep cool. And uh, remember, God is on your side. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. We are blessed and we're blessed by the best. Amen. Bye-bye for now.